All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's tonight, Friday Night Lights, part 107. People pleasing pastors. People pleasing pastors. We're going to be talking about the, the itching ears and all grace all the time. We're going to be talking about how a pastor is supposed to lead the flock. And we're also going to be talking about praise and worship. And I'm going to use an example that I heard from a great devotional the other morning. So if you want to open up our first, our first scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. First, we'll get some music and then we will jump into it. All right, so if you'll bow your heads, we'll pray in, and then we will get started here. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord. We want to thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we've gotten with those close to us. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings, all the provisions. Lord, we ask that, we ask that this message be your words, your will. Lord, we ask that it reach those that need to hear it. Lord, we ask that it not be just people pleasing, that it be pleasing to you. Lord, we ask that you fill this place and just let your word be spoken. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So, again, tonight we're going to talk about people pleasing pastors. People pleasing pastors. And there's a lot of them. And 
We're going to talk about the pastors and we're going to talk about the people that go to try to find these people pleasing pastors. And I've got three points that we're going to go through. I'm going to go based off of, off of how they tell you to organize a, a sermon. I've got three points. And the first point is the itching ears. The itching ears. See, we, we see a lot of pastors who scratch those itching ears. And they become so big and, and, and have so many people in their congregation because, well, they scratch those itching ears. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean to scratch the itching ears? What are we talking about? means that they tell you what you want to hear. You want the back, like a dog, you want the back of your ear scratched. You got to itch behind your ear. And if, if you're a dog, you got to itch behind your ear. You want your human to scratch behind your ears and make you feel all better. They give you what you want to hear. Now, as I said, these pastors are not really correct because they are just giving you what you want to hear. But the people continue to go, and these pastors have churches that are massive because the people go and want to have that. They give you all grace all the time with no repentance necessary. They don't tell you that what you're doing is wrong. They don't tell you that you need to turn from what you're doing. They certainly will not step on your toes. They certainly will not tell you the things that are difficult to say. They're not leading. They're not leading you anywhere. They're filling you full of the sunshine and rainbows but not telling you how to actually have peace. They're not telling you how you actually get peace with things. They're not telling you how you get in a actual relationship with God. They're just telling you that everything is all great all the time. So whenever things do happen and things aren't sunshine and rainbow, well, why? You have no idea how to deal with anything because you haven't been led in a way that's going to lead you. Sometimes in order to lead you, you got to step on your toes. Sometimes in order for me to be led, because I need to be led as well, my toes need to be stepped on. All grace all the time without repentance. All grace all the time without saying that you have done a single thing wrong. Well, 2 Timothy verses 2 Timothy excuse me, let me get it out. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 specifically talks about this. The second Timothy is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy as he was taking over the pastorship of the church of Ephesus. And he's writing to Timothy and he writes in chapter four, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right, even when it is not. Keep your sense of urgency, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome. Correct those who err in doctrine or behavior. Warn those who sin. Exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity with inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine an accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers 
one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors they hold. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and will wander off into myths and man-made fictions and will accept the unacceptable. But as for you, be clear-headed in every situation. Stay calm and cool and steady. Endure every hardship without flinching. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the duties of your ministry. Those verses specifically call out these people that are wanting to have their ears scratched, their ears tickled, get something pleasing, and go to many different teachers to the point where they are believing man-made fiction over God's Word. It tells, he tells Timothy to take the, 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 the urgency, to keep the sense of urgency, to go and preach the word, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, convenient or unconvenient, welcome or unwelcome, to correct those who are in, in their behavior, to warn those who sin, also to extort and en- exhort and encourage. The exhort and encourage is one, one aspect of it. One aspect. Yes, as a pastor, it is our job to encourage and give you that hope and that peace that Jesus gives. But it also tells us that as pastors, our job is to correct and warn as well. So if all I'm doing is encouraging, where's the truth in love? Am I encouraging you to do things that are wrong? That's called enabling. Actually, that's worse than enabling. You're encouraging them to do what's wrong. We are not, as pastors, supposed to be enablers. And you, as people, no one... No one likes to be told that what they are doing is wrong. No one likes that. No one likes that. But sometimes we need it. Sometimes we need it. And that brings me into point number two. Point number two. And that is the pastor leads the the flock. The pastor leads the flock. See, the Bible uses the terminology that, that, that we have the ultimate shepherd, and then he, 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 he anoints other shepherds to help look after his flock. Pastors are part of the flock as well, but they're, it's, a, it's a weird analogy. Pastors are supposed to help lead the flock, supposed to shepherd the flock of sheep, right? Well, the Bible tells us that we have to repent. So the itching ears with all grace all the time without repentance is wrong. It's it's not right. And 2 Peter verses 3 through 9 is our next verses. 2 Peter verses 3 through 9 tells us about this exact thing. 2 Peter verses 3 through 9. Uh, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I apologize, I said it incorrectly. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And it says, The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act, and is not slow about his promise, as some count slow, slowness, but is extraordinarily patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He's patient with us because he wants us to come to repentance. He wants us to come to a place where we can say, I messed up, Lord, please forgive me. And that can be washed away. He wants to wash it away from us. He wants us to come to that, come to him and Come and be cleaned off. Verse 
Peter is writing this. Peter is writing these verses right here and saying that, that God doesn't want us to perish. And it could have very easily have said he doesn't want any to perish, but for all to have eternal life. Because that is part of God's will for us as well. And, and it does actually say that in another verse as well, that, that God does not want any to perish, but for all to come into everlasting life. But Peter here, Peter says he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. For all to come to repentance. Now, what is extraordinary about this is this is not the first time that Peter has said these words. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38. And here in Acts chapter 2, we have Peter, and Peter is, John's there with them, but Peter does the vast majority of the talking here. They are standing before a group of the Jews who had been responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. And he is, Peter is hammering them a little bit. He's, he's kind of going after them. And it starts hitting these people. What have we done? It starts kind of hitting them of what did we do and how do we make this right? We messed up. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38. 37 picks up right here. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart with remorse and anxiety. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what do we do? What do we do? And Peter said, there's nothing you can't do. You're all going to die and go to hell, right? No. He said, don't worry about it. You're fine, right? No. He said, it's all grace all the time. You don't need to do anything, right? No. Verse 38 says, and Peter said to them, repent. It's the first thing that he said. Repent. And repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Now, that word, that word, if a pastor says that word, everybody nowadays has this bad connotation with the word repent. This bad connotation. Oh, that's a that's a cuss word. No. No, it's not. Repent. What does repent mean? What does repent mean? To change your old way of thinking, turn from your sinful ways, accept and follow Jesus as the Messiah. Repentance means that you turn away from those things. You turn from it. So if you've got you got a you got a drinking problem, you repent from the drinking and you try to turn away. Does that mean that it's going to happen immediately overnight and you'll never ever even look at another drink again? No. It means that you're turning away from it and trying your best not to give in to that. Pastors aren't cussing at you when they tell you that you need to repent. Pastors aren't telling you that you're an awful person when they tell you, hey, that's not what you're doing there is not really right. You probably need to repent from that. We're not telling you that you're awful. But nobody likes to hear that they are not perfectly perfect in the way that they are. No one likes to be told that anything that they are doing is in any way wrong on any level. But, you know, pastors are supposed to point you in the right way, even when you don't want to hear it. 
pastors are supposed to be shepherds leading the flock to where they're supposed to go, right? Leading them in the right way. So the Bible uses <laughs> the Bible uses the analogies of sheep, shepherds and sheep, right? Well, I didn't grow up around sheep, but I did grow up around cattle. I did grow up around cattle. My grandfather kept about 26, 26 to 30 some odd head of cattle. And, you know, a shepherd uses uses the, 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 the shepherd's staff with the hook on it. A cattle herder, nowadays, my granddad had one. They use a hot shot. Cattle prod. Now, these cattle prods, hot shots as we call them, kind of like a very low voltage stun gun on a stick. Does it injure the cattle? No, not at all. Does it feel real good? Not really. How do I know? Because I got hit with one. Few, 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 few. No, I'm fine. I'm joking. I'm fine. It. I got hit with a few of them whenever I was a kid. <laughs> Me and my cousin would hit each other with the with a hot shot. It was a game. Does it feel real good? No. Is it going to do any any damage? Is it actually going to hurt? It's not going to hurt. It's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel good at all. But you use it in order to get the cattle to go through the shoots that you want to get them to go through. Because let's face it, cows are very stubborn and ornery. And they ain't going to want to do what you want them to do 90% of the time. Closer to 99% of the time. So you got to use a little bit of a hot shot. You got to use a little bit of that stun gun to prod them, the cattle prod, to prod them to get them to go this way. No, not that way. That way. Oh, but that's animal cruelty, right? That's just cruel. How could you possibly do that? That's so cruel. You're injuring these animals. Let me give you some facts. Before, you, before PETA comes on here and starts hammering me, let me give you some facts. The battery voltage on a Thorn Electric Livestock Prod, the shock, the shock current, the current that comes out from the shock, is 0.85, so zero for, for, for those in public school. Let's do some let's do some some decimals here. I know it's difficult. They didn't teach you that in public school. So 0 0.85 milliamps. Millionths of an amp. Okay. What does that mean? How do you how do you equate that? Well, <laughs> You know, on your cell phone, you have the fast chargers that charge your phones faster. Those are around 3,000 milliamps. A normal charger is still at 1,000 milliamps. The shock current on those cattle prods is 0.85 milliamps. Just saying. Get hit by get hit by 240 volts and then we'll talk. But essentially, the voltage on that is less than a nine volt battery, and we used to lick those all the time. The voltage, the voltage on a Thorn Electric livestock prod is 8.4 volts. 8.4 volts, less than a nine volt battery. We used to lick nine volt batteries all the time. So all you PETA people, you can back off. So that brings me to my third point. And the third point is praise and worship. Praise and worship. And this comes from one of my coworkers the other morning. He gave a devotional at work. His name is David Hethcock. And this was actually his first time doing a Devo. And he nailed it out of the park. 
I mean, perfect. And I asked him for the if I could use his words. I didn't write them all down, so I hope I get everything the way that he wanted it to be done. So David, David said, you know, we're doing devos on the attributes of God. But I want to talk about another attribute of God. God's our Father, right? And, and we can go into, into the aspect of God the Father. But, you know, a lot of times we go into church... And all we want to do is the praise and worship aspects. All we want to do is, oh, oh, Father, you are so great. Oh, God, you're so great. Now, David looked at one of uh, one of our other co-workers who he knows has kids and works with. And he said, you know, hey, if, you're, if you told your son, go clean your room. Hey, son, I need you to go clean your room. And your son looks at you and says, oh, Dad, you're so great. Okay, thank you. Now go clean your room. Dad, you're the best dad in the world. Son, go clean your room. I, everybody, I want everybody to know my dad is the greatest dad. Okay, thank you, but go clean your room. At a certain point, your son is not listening to what you want him to do. And as much as he's trying to say that you're the best, he's still not doing what you want him to do. So how often do we, as God's children, do the same thing? Praise and worship is great. It's great. It's great. If my son, who's sitting right here, if my son was going around saying, telling everybody I've got the best dad in the world, that would make me feel great. But if he's not doing what I want him to do, I don't care how many times he's saying that to everybody else. I don't care. Go do what I told you to go do. So this also goes into the people-pleasing pastor's aspect. I'm going to bring it back around. The people-pleasing pastor's aspect. People-pleasing churches. Because there's a lot of churches that have smokes and smoke, smoke machines and lasers. And, you know, the praise and worship is you might as well have a concert up there. And there's nothing wrong with, with some of that. If you want to get into the praise of worship and have and have it going like that, that's great. But where are you at? Are you listening to what God is telling you to do? Or are you just there for a concert and say, oh, God is the greatest, even though I'm not listening to anything that he's telling me. I'm not doing what God actually wants me to do, but he is so great, even though I'm not listening to anything he tells me to do. David ended his devotional with, we need to check our hearts. When we say that God is so great, are we doing the things that God wants us to do? Because if not, it really, it really ain't much to say, I have the best father in the world if you ain't listening to what he's telling you to do. But we like to go to these shows. People love to go to these shows. Are you going to get closer to God or are you going to a show? I'm going to wrap this up here. No, I am not a people-pleasing pastor. Yes, I will step on your toes. Yes, I will step on my own toes. I have done so numerous times through the sermons that I've, that I've been preaching. A lot of the sermons that I've preached have been about me. Do I expect anyone to be perfect? Absolutely not, because the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it also tells us that we are to call out our brethren and correct. And if you see me doing something that I shouldn't be doing, I would hope that you as my brethren would tell me. My wife's looking at me all kinds of funny right now. <laughs> but no, we we should be we should be 
helping each other. Now that doesn't, how does that look? If I went to you and said, you idiot, don't, you know better than to do that, you stupid idiot. Am I doing that correctly? Not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It has to be the truth in love. It has to be both on equal parts. Not the truth and not almost all truth and very little love. Not almost all love and very little truth. It's got to be on evil, equal, even levels. We are to help each other, encourage one another, but also to warn against sin. That verse that I read in 2 Timothy does not only apply to pastors. If it only applied to pastors, it, there would be a separate book for pastors where Paul's letters would be. It applies for everyone. It applies for everyone. We are all to follow these things. We need to repent. We need to repent. We should be in the habit of repenting. That should be part of our prayer. You go back and look at the Lord's Prayer. It says, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those, the trespasses of others. That's part of the model prayer is asking for forgiveness. We shouldn't just be going to whoever's going to tell us what we want to hear. We shouldn't be running around to every person that we can come across asking the same question over and over and over until we get the answer that we want to hear. We shouldn't be going and looking at all of these other man-made fictional doctrines and ignoring God in doing so because we go off on all these other fictional myths Stay true to God's word. Be okay with taking some constructive criticism. If it's just criticism to criticize, then no. But if it is there to help you, if it's sound, if you've tested the spirits and it is sound, solid advice, take it. If you have tested the spirits and know that it is the person is trying to help you and it's sound, solid advice, But no, you don't want to hear it from this person. I'm going to go ask this person, this person, until they tell me what I want to hear. I want to get my ear scratched. With that, I'm going to close this one out. If you'll bow your heads and pray with me, please. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord. We ask, we ask that you just keep guiding us. Lord, we ask that you show us the next step. Even when we have no clue where the destination is, we ask that you show us the next step. The next step. And the next step. Lord, we ask that you light it up. Glow in the dark, light it up to where we can see clearly exactly where our foot is supposed to go. Lord, we thank you for this message. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to share this message. Lord, we, we thank you for all of the provisions. And Lord, we just ask that you give us a rest night, restful night's sleep tonight and a blessed day tomorrow. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. With that, I will see you guys back Sunday morning. Sunday morning service, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Wednesday night Bible study. The room starts at 6.30. Bible study starts at 7. If you want to join, let me know. I have to send you an invite because Facebook rules. Um, but I have to send you an invite into the room. You, call, you go in. It's a Facebook, like Zoom meeting, um, video call. Um, we're going over sanctification right now in the Bible study. If you want to join, just let me know. I can, I can add you to that group. Then Friday Night Lights, which you're watching right now, Friday Night Lights, Friday night at 8 p.m. Until next time, I love you guys, and I will see you later.